You know when you're browsing through hundreds of movies on a streaming service and then finally one of them speaks to you? So you decide to give it a chance and nine times out of 10, it's trash. Well, I'm about to tell you about the one tenth exception I had with the Swedish film Aniara. This movie is incredible. It takes the human condition and pushes it to the absolute breaking point and beyond. It's a fascinating science fiction story that I absolutely fell in love with. It's been in my top four section on Letterboxd for the better part of a year now, and I sincerely believe that more people should know about this movie. What's more is that it was written and directed by two people who have very little experience making full length motion pictures, and they absolutely knocked it out of the park, especially since they had very limited budget. It's a crime that this movie grossed only 40,000 worldwide. It's based off of a book length epic science fiction poem named Aniara, written by Swedish writer Harry Martinson. I love the way they open this movie. If you look very closely, you can spot a blip moving slowly across expansive black nothingness as the music pulses, foreshadowing the loneliness of space travel and the theme of insignificance that we'll discuss later. The movie takes place in the distant future, and it starts by giving us a glimpse of the disastrous state of Earth. Ravaged by rising sea levels and constant natural disasters, people are forced to flee to a human colony on Mars. The next scene shows people taking a cable car from Earth to a gigantic interplanetary space rig named the Aniara. Some people have burn scars from living in areas where the ozone layer has been compromised. Once aboard the Aniara, we get a glimpse of what it would be like traveling in a luxurious space rig. Basically, if you can think of it, it exists on this ship. You can even go shopping. The movie mostly revolves around the protagonist, MR. She's a Mima robe that works on the Aniara with a highly advanced piece of tech called the Mima. Its sole function is to temporarily take over the mind and transport you to a place where you feel calm and free of your worries. It was originally created by the first settlers on Mars so they could visit Earth again as it once was. The way you use it is you go into this room and you lay face down on the floor, which then allows the tech to take over your mind, so to speak. And that's where MR comes into play. She's trained to resist the images of the Mima, so she can assist people coming in and out of the Mima Hall. We're then shown a piece of debris floating through space, and shortly after, the Aniara drifts off course, causing shipwide panic and confusion. The captain explains to the passengers that they had to adjust the ship's course to avoid the debris, but in doing so, a screw penetrated the ship's reactor, and the power station caught fire, and they had no choice but to eject all of the ship's fuel, so they are now drifting off course with no way to correct it. According to the captain, this is an anomaly, so he tells the passengers that they will have to wait until they find a celestial body so they can use its orbit to slingshot them back on course to Mars. He tells them this should take no more than two years. Hearing this, people are shocked. They were meant to stay on the ship for only three weeks, but now they're being told that they have no choice but to remain on the ship for years. They're having a hard time processing their new reality. People are seen crowding and demanding answers. The captain is informed at a meeting that they have about two months supply of food before they'll need to start rationing. Sometime beyond that, if needed, they can feed on algae that they can grow on board. We then see MR talking to her roommate. MR reveals that she has nobody waiting for her on Mars, so she isn't in a state of crisis like many on board. Then three weeks pass. The Mima Hall is increasing in popularity as more and more people use it to temporarily forget their unfortunate circumstances. MR is forcing people out because of its increasing demand. With the minimal amount of free time she has, in the middle of the night, she uses it to swim. During this time, she meets a woman named Isagel. She's one of the ship's co-pilots. We then get another scene of MR talking to her roommate, the astronomer, who's an alcoholic elderly woman with a realistic and pessimistic outlook on their situation. Based on her knowledge of the star systems, there isn't another celestial body that they'll hit in their lifetimes. She reveals that the captain lied to the passengers to avoid widespread panic. With this new knowledge, unable to sleep, MR peers out into space and starts to have a panic attack. She rushes to the Mima Hall in desperation. The next day, MR is rushed to the aid of a passenger. He's also suffering from a panic attack. He tells her that he was told by the astronomer when she was drunk that there isn't any planet that they can use to turn around. MR tells him that Mars isn't the paradise he thinks it is. It's cold and 99.9% .9 of plants don't grow there, that they might as well make the ship their home. He has a difficult time accepting this, so they rush him to the Mima Hall. MR then has to help a security guard leave the hall because Mima occupied his mind while he was helping with the passenger. It's little details like this that I adore about this movie. 
Some time passes and MR finally gets a meeting with the captain. She asks for more hands to help with the increasing demand of the Mimo Hall. She lets it slip that she knows that there isn't any celestial body that they can use to turn back to Mars. The captain tells her that once the passengers get used to eating the ship's self-sustaining algae, they'll go public with the situation, adding that the ship is basically its own planet anyway. Three years pass. At this point, the passengers of the ship have formed little communities. People have learned to live on this ship for the most part. But then little issues start to prop up, like the ship's water purifier starts to malfunction, the Mimo Hall's demand only increases, one man even tries to bribe MR to stay a little longer after his session. We're shown another conversation between MR and the astronomer. The astronomer compares the Aniara drifting through space to the tiny bubble sitting in her whiskey. She says that they may be moving at incredible speeds, but within the vastness of space they may as well be sitting still for all the good it'll do them. I love this comparison. It really does illustrate well their situation. Most people on board are ignorant of the star systems and how far apart celestial bodies really are. The astronomer is plagued with this knowledge, so she uses drinking to feel anything but dread. In the next scene, MR is using Mima in the early morning just before they open. In her mind, she's floating in a lake and birds are flying overhead. That is, until the birds start disintegrating one by one. Some drop from the sky, their dead bodies hitting the water. MR, startled, wakes herself up. She has hardly any time to assess the issue because as soon as they open, people pile in for their sessions. Then Mima starts to speak out loud in a fashion that MR has never seen. A passenger in the Mima Hall starts whimpering. MR assesses him with a device to see what he's seeing. And while he's still on Earth, instead of peace and calm, he's seeing horror and death. She consoles him as hundreds of people who are lined up outside the Mimo Hall look on in confusion. Because of this, MR is forced to temporarily shut down the hall, and of course the passengers are not okay with this. MR is brought before the captain, who appears to use excessive working out as a way to cope with their newfound reality. MR tells him that Mima needs a couple weeks to rest, and that it's worrying that she reduces herself to human speech. Basically, imagine a PC running Cyberpunk 2077 on max settings for three years straight. Yeah, you might want to give it a rest. <laughs> And not only that, Mima is absorbing everyone's memories, everyone's worries, everyone's depression, and it's not given enough time to filter all this out, and it's starting to take a toll on it. In an attempt to understand what's happening, MR starts to record everything the Mima says. Most of it is gibberish. Some of it seems like a cry for help. Then, without warning, people start piling into the Mima Hall. MR desperately tries to get them to leave, but it's too late. Mima destroys herself, its last words being, how grim it always is, one's detonation. In the next scene, MR lays in bed stricken with grief, blaming herself for the destruction of the Mima, and it's made only worse that this was the only thing that gave her any sort of solace or purpose. This scene is even more powerful, seeing as how normally in situations such as this, she had used the Mima to improve her mood and outlook, but without the Mima tech available, she's forced to wallow in her misery. The passengers then memorialize Mima and blame MR for its destruction, spreading rumors that she wanted it all to herself. The captain also blames MR for Mima's destruction, and since it was such a valuable tool, the captain is furious and has MR hunted down. The co-pilot Isigel, who knows MR personally and is aware of the truth about Mima, stands up to the captain. He won't listen to her, so she strikes him and runs. When security catches her, they beat her. MR and Isigel are both eventually locked away. Year 4. The passengers start forming cults, and you can tell the mental well-being of a large majority of the people aboard is degrading. The suicide rate is climbing. There's an extremely eerie shot of this cult slowly approaching the camera from deep within a hallway. They're chanting, forgive us, forgive us, over and over. They believe that they're being punished by some higher power. MR and Isigel are part of this group of prisoners that are assigned different jobs depending on what is needed most. Isigel is assigned logistics, and MR is assigned as a kid's teacher. Over the course of the last year, they were locked up together and they became close. They enter a sauna together. There's another woman sitting there. She tells them about this cult called the Libadellas, led by a person named Libadell. She asks them if they want to join them so they can canonize Mima. Basically, they worship the memory of Mima as some sort of deity. This woman convinces MR that they mean her no harm because they believe Mima died of grief and MR had nothing to do with it. MR and Isigel join the cult in the Mima Hall. Everyone undresses and decorates their bodies with face paint. This scene kind of reminds me of that one scene from Midsummer. From this scene, you can tell that a lot of the occupants of Aniara have put their inhibitions aside in an attempt to feel something other than dread. With the absence of Mima, people are forced to find their own ways of producing serotonin to stay sane. 
and it seems like an orgy under the dead machine that once made these people forget about their worries is the closest they can get to that feeling that Mima once gave them. Year 5 Isagel and Mr. are still together, only now Isagel is pregnant, likely because of the orgies they attend. The idea of giving birth in a floating coffin haunts Isagel. Mr. does her best to console her and stay optimistic. We're shown that the astronomer is suffering greatly from alcoholism and tries her best to stay constantly drunk. Mr. has the idea to build a beam screen that shows images of Earth outside the ship's windows to raise morale. She proposes the idea to the captain, but is shut down immediately. He believes that she is of more value as a teacher. The next scene shows Isagel giving birth. Mr. loves the child and is seemingly endlessly optimistic. Isagel can't help but feel like Mr.'s high hopes are insincere and misplaced. While Mr. is teaching a class, Isagel is bathing her baby. She toys with the idea of drowning him until a man walks in the room and calls out to her. This is when some hope drops in their laps. Isagel and Mr. are called to the bridge. An anomaly has been detected. A high-speed probe that may carry enough fuel for them to turn the ship around and get themselves back on track to Mars is headed straight for them. It'll take 14 months for the probe to reach them. The captain announces the good news to the passengers and everyone celebrates. It looks like things are finally looking up. Year 6. The morale of the passengers has noticeably increased with this newfound knowledge. Some of the crew virtually trains to use grappling claws to retrieve the probe, and they fail, showing how difficult this task will be. The time comes and the crew is able to successfully retrieve the probe. Then the testing begins. The scientists and engineers on board are unsure what the probe is and aren't positive that it contains fuel that is compatible with the ship that they're on. Mr. and Isagel's relationship has blossomed since the news, and they've formed a healthy family unit with the child. After examining the probe, the astronomer isn't very optimistic. Mr. finds her drinking again. The next day, one of the scientists says it's a miracle they found the probe. The astronomer hears this and challenges it, saying the probe showing up was devoid of any meaning. She's kind of a doomer. <laughs> the passengers are sick of waiting to hear about the probe, and a group of them demand answers. The captain tells the research team that's working on the probe to keep quiet about it until they are positive it won't yield any results. The astronomer is already confident in her assessment that the probe won't help them, and she feels like the captain is delaying the inevitable. She compares the ship to a floating sarcophagus. In an attempt to stop her from spreading rumors, the captain uses a taser on her, resulting in her death. Mr. was close to the astronomer, so she's taking the death pretty hard. In order to escape her mind, she takes some drugs with her friends, one of which is having a very bad trip. She goes out dancing with this guy. The Aniara then travels through a space storm of some sort. A lot of passengers were standing by the windows taking in the colors. The captain tries to get the passengers to safety by speaking through the intercom, but it's too late. They suffer insane turbulence, sending passengers flying every which direction. The person that Mr. was dancing with flies against the wall and hits his head and dies. When they exit the storm, Mr. rushes up a stairway past a corpse to return to Isagel and the child, both of which were unharmed. Later, they show many bodies covered with sheets. You can tell the captain's mental health is starting to deteriorate. His beard is now unkempt and graying, and he looks completely drained. We're then shown Mr. working with a small team on getting the beam projector working. It's unknown whether the captain allowed her to do this or if she's doing it in her free time. Either way, they start it up, and it's a sight to behold. A massive display of cascading waterfalls and greenery is projected on either side of the ship, we're shown passengers looking on in awe. At this point, Isagel's mental health is at an all-time low, and she puts on a face in front of Mr. to keep her happy. Mr. returns home the next day to find the door blocked by Isagel's body. She hung herself on the door handle. She also killed her child. Year 10. People are trying to pass the time by attending a concert. The captain tries desperately to raise morale by telling them that they are pioneers, that they have traveled further into space than any people before them. He has Mr. come up on stage and awards her an honorary medal for her beam screen. She notices that the captain had wrapped his arm to stop the bleeding from a self-inflicted wound to his wrist, making it clear to her that the captain is suffering just as much as everyone else, and that it's very unlikely that he believes what he's saying. Mr. appears older and more worn down. Her cheerful and optimistic attitude has vanished. When she returns to her unkempt, cluttered apartment, she drops the metal on the floor and flops onto her bed, her place being a direct reflection of her mindset. The sink water runs black and their algae reserves are looking low. Year 24. The lights on the ship have all but been shut off. 
Whether this was due to an electrical shortage or some other cause remains unknown. A voice speaks within the confines of Mima's grave. At this point, MR has given herself over completely to the few remaining members of a cult. A blind woman speaks of a time when they knew sunlight and warmth, referring to the sun as a god. Year 5,981,407. The lifeless ship finally finds a celestial body. And then the credits roll. So yeah, guys, that's the movie. <laughs> Overall, I love the movie, but there is one thing that I thought was strange. Why didn't they try to get help from anybody when the ship veered off course? They couldn't have someone from Mars or someone from Earth do something to try and knock them back on course? I don't know, maybe this was like the last batch of people going to Mars, and since the people on Mars were three weeks away, I think maybe the time it would take for the people on Mars to reach the Aniara, it would have been too late anyway. I'm not sure. Other than that, I love the movie. It illustrates in such a great way how dependent we are on escapism to survive, how we're reliant on hope to stay sane. We simply can't handle the idea that we're insignificant. We push it aside at all costs, but in this movie, it stares the characters directly in the face whenever they look out their windows. They try to drown out their circumstances with constant entertainment. Eventually, the only solace they could find was in each other, and when that failed, there was nothing left but dreams of a lifelong past. Every single actor in this movie did an astounding job, especially Emily Garbers. The sound design in this movie is amazing, the pacing was perfect, the cinematography was on point, I love how the movie started slow, but as the time skipped on and on, and the amount of time between each time skip grew, the less that we were shown, because as time went on, the activity on the ship lessened and lessened. I loved each character and how they showed us the ways in which they each dealt with this dreadful situation. It's one of those films where you can't help but sit there in silence and watch the credits roll, and the accompanying music that plays as you sit there and try to take it all in is perfect. So yeah guys, that was Aniara. If you didn't know about this movie, then I am proud to be the one to introduce it to you. Please go out and watch it, because I swear to you, even with the spoilers, it's a great movie, and a lot of the scenes will leave you awestruck. If you're going to watch it, please at least rent it, because the people that worked on this deserve some money for it, I think. <laughs> but yeah, I think that will do it. If you have any recommendations for what you would like me to review next, please put them in the comments section down below, or reach out to me on Twitter at TV. Again, please don't forget to check out AlienClothing.com, my personal clothing brand, and I'll see you guys in the next one. So rör sig en blåsa framåt, oändligt långsamt. På samma sätt rör vi oss framåt. Men fastän vi har en otroligt hög fart. Så är det precis som om vi står alldeles still.